Welcome. I'm Daniel Minty, a cognitive behavioral therapist, teacher, and writer. Today I'll be presenting an overview of the science we call CBT, beginning about 150 years ago and moving forward to the present. I'll be sharing a few PowerPoint slides that summarize the role of emotion in the big picture of human life and explain the difference between natural and unnatural emotion and cognition. We'll then take a look at the ways in which CBT can help us select those feelings and thoughts we most want to live with, and the ways in which CBT changes not only the mind, but the brain and body as well. Finally, I'll share a simple tool you can use to map this information onto any moment in your own life. I was teaching in India recently and visited the Karla Caves, a Buddhist shrine built before the start of the Common Era. Found these inscriptions there of Vedic literature. And in the Vedas, we see perhaps the first record of the relationship between thinking and one's experience of human life. So cognitive behavioral therapy is a very ancient science and seems to go back to the very beginnings of the human experience. While we speak of cognition and behavior, the point of that exercise is emotion. The reason we would practice CBT is because we want to feel differently than we do, want to feel less of some negative emotion, say, or perhaps more of some positive emotion. Emotion itself is life's first milieu. It precedes cognition and is moderately heritable. About 50% of our emotionality is related directly to our genes. The other 50% would have to do with our environment, our context and personal choices that we'd make. So emotion, like physiology, is a setting for all other human experience. Our sensations, our perceptions, our actions, our thinking, these all take place in the context of our emotionality. And that emotionality is interdependent on all of the rest of human experience. Take, for example, the experience of pain. If we're depressed, the same stimulus is going to hurt more than if we're not. And if we're in a chronic state of pain, the probability that we will also become depressed goes way up. Emotion also has a principal role to play in learning and in memory. You'll experience thousands of things today, and tomorrow you'll only remember a few of those experiences. The reason is that you cared about what happened to you in the course of those experiences. If we learn something, it's because we care about doing that. If we're completely indifferent, it's very unlikely that we're actually going to learn new content at all. We've noted that the science of emotion is uh, an ancient science. When the Buddha looked up from beneath the Bodhi tree, 
saw the morning star and was enlightened. He exclaimed, all beings are already enlightened. It's only their delusive thoughts and feelings that obscure that fact. A century or so later, Socrates gave us the allegory of the cave. It's a wonderful metaphor for the ways in which we mistake our thoughts about reality for reality itself and suffer the consequences of that mistake. In 1872, Charles Darwin published his book on emotion. He was interested, of course, in the links between human emotionality and the emotionality found in species other than ourselves. This has spurred research, which is ongoing today. Neuroscientists at the Max Planck Institute in Germany are using high-speed video cameras to capture subtle facial expressions in mice. They've noticed that a mouse will smile. Doesn't look much like Mickey or Minnie. It involves the ears moving forward and the nose down towards the mouth. Activity in nerve cells in the mice's brains change with their facial expressions in an area known as the insular cortex. This is an area of the human brain, which also changes when we smile and when we frown. So emotionality continues to be something that we share probably throughout all vertebrate species. I'd like to distinguish between two broad types of emotion, natural negative emotion and unnatural negative emotion. Natural negative emotion involves feelings like fear. And fear behavior too is found across all vertebrate species. It's an acute autonomic response to an immediate environmental threat. This response is then followed by a reset from fight and flight to the parasympathetic side of the central nervous system, sometimes called rest and digest. Nature selects for both these responses because having them increases the probability that will pass our genes on to the next generation. I was in Bangalore, India, and stepped into the street after looking to the left to check for oncoming traffic. This is what one would do in northern New Mexico. But traffic in India follows the British rules. And as I stepped into the street, I heard a loud horn and turned and saw a truck bearing down on me from the right. So at that moment, I experienced this acute autonomic response and a bunch of adrenaline dumped into my system and a bunch of blood flow went to my large muscle groups and I jumped back onto the curb before the truck passed me. Another natural negative emotion is sadness. Grief and sadness are adaptive physical and psychological responses to loss. So the loss might be a loved one or one's home. And grief behavior too has been observed across species as various as whales and peccaries. Apparently having this response helps us find our way forward together in our communities and recognize the bonds that exist between us. Let's look now at the second class 
of negative emotion, unnatural negative emotion. An example of unnatural negative emotion is anxiety. Instead of being a response to an immediate environmental threat, anxiety is a response to distorted thinking and perhaps to avoidant behavior. This response is attended by structural and functional changes throughout the brain and body. And when those changes occur in a chronic way, they're accompanied by many health risks. We think that the increased comorbidity of cardiovascular illness and dementia is probably mediated by the inflammation response, which anxiety also produces. If sadness and grief are natural negative emotions, their unnatural counterpart would be depression. Here again, depression is not related to a loss, but rather to distorted thinking and behavioral suppression. And when depression is a chronic state, it too is accompanied by structural and functional changes in the brain and body. And those changes travel with a variety of health risks, in part due to the decreased immune response that we experience when we're depressed. Just as emotion can be either natural or unnatural, so too can cognition. I think of natural thought patterns, the way I would think of a natural human posture. When we stand and walk a certain way, we are supported by our structure and can use muscular energy to move towards things that we want. When we're standing or walking in an unnatural way, we need to use energy to hold ourselves in that position. And that holding will likely, over time, produce pain and fatigue. So a natural thought is a good roadmap of reality. That is to say, the thought matches the fact pattern of our lives. Our natural or rational thoughts do not create unhealthy negative emotion, and they may actually produce positive emotion. An example might be a student who says to herself, if I study for the final, there's a better probability that I'll get a good grade. Telling herself that, she may experience motivation to study and positive anticipation of that good grade. Unnatural thoughts, we could also call distorted thoughts. The word distorted comes to us from the Latin and it means to twist. So a distorted thought is a thought with a twist. As such, it's a poor map of reality. And believing such thoughts, just as following a bad roadmap, is going to create unnatural negative emotion like anxiety or depression. So distortion is an active ingredient in an unnatural thought. And so too is belief. We might have a wildly distorted thought, but if we don't believe it, it probably won't create emotional turmoil for us. So going back to our, our students, perhaps she says to herself, I'm going to fail the exam. And we can see how that thought would create unnatural negative emotion, very likely anxiety and or depression. 
Here's a few common distortions taken from my book, Reclaiming Life After Trauma. The student who told herself she would fail her exam was practicing clairvoyance, that is, pretending that she could foretell the future. A thought might be so focused on one part of the picture as though we're looking through a telescope that we miss the bigger picture. Perfectionism is a common distortion. Thoughts that tell us we have to get things just right. Judgment, too, is very common. This generally takes the form of should statements, telling ourselves that we or other people or the world should be a certain way. And then finally, truthiness is those thoughts that say, well, it feels true, therefore it must be true. It feels like that person would reject me if I approach them. So they probably will. Now, any thought, natural or unnatural, doesn't spontaneously occur in our frontal lobes. Rather, it's nested in an entire ecology of other aspects of our experience. At the ground level, we have our beliefs or assumptions about the way things are. These beliefs are constantly triggered by events that occur in our environment. When a belief is triggered, it creates a thought, either natural or unnatural, that generates an emotion, natural or unnatural, which drives a behavior, either goal-oriented or self-defeating. And our behaviors, in turn, create data that proves our beliefs are true. Let's look at how that's happening for me right now. I have a belief that CBT is a powerful tool for human change. That belief gets triggered by people who ask me to teach or to write or to see them as patients. Those triggers create thoughts. In this case, I could share this class with a wider audience. That thought generates an emotion, in my case, enthusiasm. That enthusiasm drives a behavior, creating this video. And that creation and the fact that you are viewing it are data in support of my belief that CBT is worth sharing. So we could take any moment of anyone's life and map these six discrete elements onto it, thus understanding in a deeper way the ecology of human experience. As we've seen, CBT is based on the same principles as all of the great world religions and philosophies. That is, the notion that our beliefs, thoughts, and behaviors create our emotions, and thus much of the milieu of our living and dying. As a result, each of these three our belief systems, our thoughts, and our actions are doorways into transformation into a new milieu. Let's look at two of these now. You've already learned one cognitive tool, which is identifying distortions in thoughts. When I realize 
something that I'm telling myself is upsetting me, I can quickly realize that I'm involved with judgment or with clairvoyance. And this helps me believe in these thoughts considerably less than I otherwise would. We can take an unnatural thought and find a way to restate it such that it becomes a natural thought. Another way of saying that is we can remove the distortion from the thought and leave the rest of the content in place such that the thought is now a pretty good roadmap for the fact pattern in our lives. We can also evaluate the costs and the benefits of certain thought patterns. Even if a thought pattern is creating great anxiety, say, we'll always be able to identify an upside to holding on to those thoughts and evaluating in a clear-eyed way the benefits that we get from telling ourselves the things we do and the price we pay to get those benefits can be a powerful motivator to create new thought patterns. We can also set up some experiments to collect data for or against a particular thought. Our brains pay a lot of attention to data. So if we have the thought, that person probably doesn't like me, we could run an experiment, approach that person, and get some data about how they respond. When my patients run these kinds of experiments in their own lives, they almost always start to get tremendously excited. They become scientists in the laboratories of their lives instead of passive victims of their circumstances. We also have behavioral tools that address the ways in which we're acting or not acting in the world. Moving towards something that we fear is called exposure. And there's a very high probability that if we're willing to start turning towards instead of away, that we'll create new data about the reality of that thing and then be able to evaluate in a more natural way the actual risk that it poses to us. We can work with something called contingency management. That is, we can rearrange the circumstances around a particular behavior. When someone asks for my help with smoking cessation, we talk about removing things like ashtrays and matches and certainly cigarettes from their home so that emitting the old behavior that is lighting up suddenly is a lot more costly and that higher cost might change the choice to continue smoking or not. Oftentimes, CBT is considered an individual therapy, but it has strong interpersonal skill building tools as well. Some of these are tools to break ice. If we're the new kid on the block, how do we break in and establish connections with people who may already be well connected with each other, but who have not yet experienced connection with us. We can also learn to be appropriately assertive. That is, instead of holding ourselves back and always putting others first, we can start to factor our own perceptions, thoughts, feelings, needs, and wishes into that picture. And finally, we can learn to become experts at processing interpersonal emotion. Perhaps the largest challenge that we face is when someone's very angry with us or when we're very angry with someone else. And they don't teach us in school 
how to process that moment in human relationship. And as a result, we tend to avoid or repress or act out feelings like anger instead of utilizing them to connect with each other in new, authentic, and vital ways. Welcome to the body mind. Speaking of distortions, the language that we use when we speak of mental health versus physical health gives us a distorted view of this phenomena. For while language separates body from mind, these are distinct entities, never separate entities. Thought itself is a physical entity. It's a nerve impulse, an electrochemical wave in the brain. Cognitive science has coined a new term for unnatural thoughts, cognitive viruses. These thoughts are called viruses because they trigger the immune system and create inflammation in the body, just as the COVID virus would. Here are two examples. If we're in chronic pain, the simple thought of making a particular movement will activate the pain neurotag. That is the cascade of sympathetic central nervous system immune system, endocrine system, and motor system responses. This occurs as well in PTSD, but in the opposite direction. Instead of thinking of something that will happen, we recall something that has happened. Traumatic memories, again, electromagnetic activity in the brain, will trigger the same cascade of physical responses in the body. These responses are expressions of the brain's desire to protect us from harm and its perception that an unnatural thought or cognitive virus is in and of itself, in fact, dangerous. Thus, the body-mind expresses the essential unity of mind and body while acknowledging that it's useful to distinguish between the two. CBT addresses cognitive viruses and studies show that it decreases allostatic load Allostatic load is uh, the biomarkers of stress in the human body. Studies have also found that CBT downregulates an overactive amygdala, which is very common with the anxiety disorders, and that CBT supports the immune response, which is a problem with depression. CBT will actually decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines and increase anti-inflammatory cytokines, thus restoring balance to this essential part of the body system. Studies have shown that CBT will increase hippocampal volume in depressed patients and the increase in lost volume correlates with a decrease in depressive symptoms. CBT also upregulates activity in the anterior cingulate cortex, an area that is oftentimes turned down with PTSD. CBT also increases heart rate variability, a baseline measure of wellness in the body, and balances the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, a major neuroendocrine system that controls reactions to stress and regulates many body processes, 
including digestion and the immune system. If you have a piece of paper, copy down these six words on the left. This will allow you to map yourself onto the basic principles of cognitive behavioral therapy in any moment of your life. You might start with the emotion, say you're feeling anxious, and then ask yourself, what am I telling myself right now? And it's very certain that you'll be telling yourself some version of the clairvoyant thought, something bad is going to happen. Working backwards, you could then say, what triggered that thought? What happened in my world just before I had that thought? And then you may be able to identify the belief that got triggered. If the emotion were anxiety and the thought that person probably doesn't like me. And the trigger was that person looked at me and frowned or looked at me and looked away. The belief might be something like, I'm just not very likable. Working in the other direction, we could then see what was the behavior that followed that emotion. In this case, it was very likely an avoidant behavior. We didn't approach that person. We didn't run an experiment. And then we can see how that avoidant behavior created data that supported the belief that I just must not be very likable because I'm still all by myself. Taking this map into any moment of your daily life will help you understand yourself a little better. It will show you the doorways into which you could walk if you wanted to transform the milieu of your experience. And it will help you appreciate the deep ecology of your human experience. We're back where we started, the ancient, and ever new science of cognition, behavior, and human experience. Thank you for joining me today. If you'd like some additional information about my work and writing, you can visit my website, www.danielminty.com.